So when we're looking at this paragraph, one of the things that they're obviously talking about is that John Adams does not have the support uh, once entering the president. What That's what they mean by a minority president is the majority of Americans did not want him in power. While Adams' enemies accuse him of striking a corrupt bargain, his political allies wished that he would strike a few more. Whether through high-mindedness or political ineptitude, Adams resultantly declined to oust efficient office holders in order to create vacancies for his supporters. During his entire administration, he removed only 12 public services servants from the federal payroll. Such stubbornness caused countless Adam followers to throw up their hands in despair. If the president would not reward party workers with political plums, why should it labor to keep him in office? So one of the things that you want to make sure that you do understand here is that within this paragraph, what they're basically saying is, I think this is the most important thing. Adams resolutely declined to oust efficient office holders in order to create vacancies for his supporter. So what Adams would do is he would keep those that he felt were good workers, although they may have not sworn loyalty to his party. Uh, so you're getting a lot of supporters that are unhappy with him. President John Quincy Adams, 67 to 1848. Drew a type by Philip Haas, 1843. Adams wrote in his diary in June 1819, nearly six years before becoming president, I am a man of reserved, cold, austere, and forbidding manners. My political adversities say, a gloomy misanthropist, and my personal enemies, an unsocial savage. So just like his father, he's very much highly criticized by his enemies. Adams' nationalistic views gave him further woes. Much of the nation was turning away from post get nationalism and toward states' rights and sectionalism. But Adams swam against the tide, confirms nationalists that he was. Adams, in his first annual message, urged upon Congress the construction of roads and can canals. He renewed George Washington's proposal for a national university and went so far to advocate federal support for an astronomical observatory. So one of the things that you want to make sure here is you understand it, when they say here, Adams' nationalistic views gave him further woes, much of the nation was turning away from the post get nationalism, what they're talking about is they are now turning away from the nationalism from the War of 1812, because remember, they're referring here to the Treaty of Ghent. And they're also saying in this paragraph that Adams is kind of against state rights, while more people were for it. The public reactions to these proposals were prompt and unfavorable. To many, workaday Americans, grubbing out stamps, astronomical observatories seems like a scandalous waste of public funds. The South, in particular, bristled. If the government if the government should take away on such heavy financial burdens, it should have to continue hated tariff duties. Worse, it could meddle in concerns like education and roads. It might even try to lay its hand on a peculiar institution of black slavery. So what we're seeing here is that many Americans were not happy with the federal works or the uh, federal authority that Adams is putting in, creating things such as observatories, uh, reviewing the stars they felt was a waste of money if you could spend it in other cases. Uh, and one of the things that they were concerned about here, if federal government should take away on heavy financial burdens, it would have to qualify, could have to continue the hated tariff duties. So that means that, of course, he's going to have to continue these taxes to fund these things. Adams' land policy likewise antagonized the Westerners. They clamored for wide open expansion and resented the president's well-meaning attempts to curb feverish speculation in the public domain. The fate of the Cherokee Indians threatened with eviction from their holdings in Georgia brought additional bitterness. White Georgians wanted the Cherokees out. They ruggedly, the ruggedly honest Adams attempted to deal fairly with the Indians. The Georgia governor, by threatening to the resort to arms, successfully resisted the efforts of Washington government to interpose federal authority on behalf of the Cherokees. Another fateful chapter was thus written in nullification of the national will. And another nail was driven in, in Adams' political coffin. So one of the things that you want to make sure that you see here is um, Adams, in many ways, is favoring the Cherokee Indians. He's very lenient. He has a policy that in some cases angers the white Georgians that want the Cherokees out. This is very important because it's going to go ahead and pave the way for Andrew Jackson. One second. So what you want to go ahead and do, and we look at our questions right here. Already we discussed number seven, who did the Speaker of House support and why? And of course that would be um, John Quincy Adams. And the reason is Henry Clay would then be named Secretary of State. 
Why was the presidential decision of 1824 called a corrupt bargain? We have covered that. Was Adams a nationalist or a state's writer? We definitely covered that. We are on number 10. 13.3, going whole hog for Jackson in 1828. Andrew Jackson's next presidential campaign started early, on February 9, 1825. The day of John Quincy Adams' controversial election by the House, and it continued noisily for nearly four years. Even before the election of 1828, the temporarily united Republicans of the era of good feelings had split into two camps. One was the National Republicans, with Adams as their standard bearer. The other was the Democratic Republicans, with the Fury Jackson heading their ticket. Rallying cries of the Jackson zealots were bargain and corruption. Who's off for Jackson? And all hail old hickory. Jacksonites planted hickory poles for their hickory tough hero. Adamsites adopted oak as a symbol of their openly independent candidate. Jackson's followers presented their hero as a rough hewn frontiersman and a stalwart champion of the common man. They denounced Adams as a corrupt aristocrat and argued that the will of the people had been thwarted in 1825 by the backstairs bargain of Adams and Clay. The only way to right the wrong was to see Jackson who then bring out reform by sweeping out the dishonest Adams gang. So a couple things you want to understand that I would go in your notes. You definitely want to title this section, Going Whole Hog for Jackson in 1828. With this paragraph, the main purpose of this is to give the descriptions of the political candidates. Andrew Jackson, referring to uh, his military career, uh, names such as Old Hickory, right? Um, and of course, they're referring to the corrupt bargain and saying that this is something that needs to be fixed. Right. On the other hand, you have those Adam supporters that were referring to him in terms of his independent thinking. Um, and of course, you're also getting here Andrew Jackson and um, the, his uh, military background once again coming to existence in terms of his reputation. Rachel Jackson, a devoted wife who did not live to become first lady. Rachel died a month after the election of 1828. Andrew Jackson was convinced that his enemy's vicious uh, accusations that she was a bigamist an adulteress had killed her. The more complicated truth was that Jackson had married Rachel Roberts, confident that her divorce had been granted. Two years later, when they discovered their dismay that it had not been, they made haste to correct the marital miscue. Why this is important is specifically because this shows the campaigning that existed during this time is Andrew Jackson would be criticized uh, for this marriage uh, while they are campaigning against each other. Much of this talk was a political hyperbole. Jackson was no frontier farmer, but a wealthy planter. He had been born in a log cabin, but now lived in a luxurious manner off the labor of his many enslaved workers. And Adams, though perhaps an aristocrat, was far from corrupt. If anything, his uncompromising morals were too elevated for the job. Mudslinging reached new lows in 1828 and the electorate developed a taste for bare-knuckle politics. Adams would not stoop to gutter tactics, but many of his backers were, backers were less squeamish. They described Jackson's mother as a prostitute and his wife as an adulteress. They printed black-bordered handbills shaped like coffins, recounting his numerous duels and brawls and trumpeting his hanging of six munis militiamen. So one of the things you understand within this is that with campaigning, um, Adams is obviously a very independent thinker. He is not corrupt. He refuses to engage in this term called mudslinging, which is dirty campaigning. Uh, however, his supporters uh, are obviously making fun of and poking fun at Jefferson, uh, exaggerating some things in terms of his military background, negative way, referring to his marriage, uh, referring to his wife as a prostitute, right? So you're starting to get some dirty campaigning here. That's the point of that paragraph. Jackson men also hit below the belt. President, Adam, President Adams had purchased with his own money and for his own use a billiard table and a set of a chessmen. In the months of rapid Jacksonites, these items became gaming tables and gambling furniture for the presidential palace. Criticism was also directed at the large sums Adams had received over years in federal salaries and well earned though they had been. He was even accused of having procured a servant girl for the lust of the Russian czar and short of having served as a pimp. 
So one of the things that we're referring to here is obviously they're calling, uh, they're saying that John Quincy Adams is not using government funds. He's buying gaming tables, gambling furniture. They're referring to him as a pimp, right? These are all things um, that are making him look bad. So he will not win the office. On voting day, the electorate split on largely sectional lines. Jackson's strong support came from the West and South. The middle states and old, nor, old Northwest were divided, while Adams won the backing of his New England and profiteered better elements of the Northeast. But when the popular vote was converted to electoral votes, General Jackson's triumph could not be denied. Old Hickory had trounced Adams by an electoral count of 178 to 83. Although a considerable part of Jackson's support was lined up by machine politics in eastern cities, particularly in New York and Pennsylvania, the political center of gravity had shifted away from the conservative eastern seaboard towards emerging states across the mountains. So all in all, what you understand about this is, of course, Andrew Jackson is victorious, right? And you could see this in this map. It goes over um, in general. One thing that you could see is in the map, uh, it goes ahead and shows the electoral vote right here and this is the popular vote so jackson goes ahead and he wins both right remember uh you need the majority of electoral votes each state is given a certain amount of electoral votes based on the amount of have house of representative members and senate members they have so for example illinois at this time uh, they would have two senators and one member in house of representatives right and remember if you win that state you get all the votes so jackson is successful um 13.4. Before we get there, a couple things that you could see. We went ahead and we answered what a mutts, what a mudslinging took place in the 1828 presidential election. So you want to make sure that you talk about mudslinging. That's dirty campaigning. Give me some examples of this. And of course, who wins the presidential election campaign and make sure that you give a valid reason why. And of course, you will find that answer. In this section right here right yep although a considerable part of jackson's port was lined up by machine politics in eastern cities particularly in new york the political center of gravity had shifted away from the conservative eastern seaboard uh towards emerging states across the mountains right so of course uh jackson is getting a lot more support uh, outside of that new england territory okay 13.4 old hickory is president the new president cut a striking figure, tall, lean, with bushy iron gray hair, brushed high above a prominent forehead, craggy eyebrows and blue eyes. His irritability and emaciated condition resulted in part from long-term bouts with the century malaria, tuberculosis, and lead poisoning from two bullets that he carried in his body from near-fatal duels. His autobiography was written in his lined face. This paragraph is trying to describe him, describe him as someone that's very tough and that's gone through, uh, obviously, a lot of turmoil through life. Jackson's upbringing had its shortcoming. Born in the Carolinas, an early orphan, mischievous Andy grew up without parental restraints. As a youth, he displayed much interest in brawling and cockfighting in his scanty opportunities for reading and spelling. Although he eventually learned to express himself in writing and vigor clarity, his grammar was always rough honed in his spelling original, like that of many contemporaries. He sometimes misspelled, misspelled a word two different ways in the same letter. So one of the things you want to understand it through these first two paragraphs is that Old Hickory's president describing him as someone that is not educated, describing him as a common man, someone that's very rough. The youthful Carolonian shrewdly moved up west of Tennessee, where fighting was prized above writing. There, through native intelligence, force of personality, and powers of leadership, he became a judge and a member of Congress. Afflicted with a violent temper, he nearly became involved in a number of duels, stabbings, and bloody trays. His passions were so proud, profound that on occasion, he would choke into silence when he tried to speak. Once again, to describing him as someone that's very rough, right? Someone that's more of, I guess you could say, in ways that uh, they used to say, I mean, a few years ago, a man's man. You know, as someone that wasn't necessarily educated, but someone um, that was always willing to put up a fight. Remember, this is the same Andrew Jackson that was part of the Paxton Boys. Taking the measure of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a military, a military hero. To some, an impetus ruffian to others. A Maryland supporter endorsed Jackson for president in his campaign in 1824 as follows. As chief judge of the Supreme Court of Tennessee, Jackson acted until his services in the field were demanded by his country. He then laid down his law books. 
the sweets of domestic life, and seized his sword to revenge his country's wrongs. The savages were murdered by hundreds, men, women, and children of our frontier. The tomahawk was reeking with blood of innocence. It was then, my country friend, that Jackson led the van. It was then this noble soldier made his pillow of snow and, for, and had for his roof canopy of heaven. Yeah, countrymen, I might extend my handbill to a volume, and I can then I cannot then give you a correct idea, Magnus and General Soul, of this unparalleled hero. Of course, this is praising Jackson in terms of his military career. In the same year, T.J. Thomas Jefferson wrote of Jackson. When I was president of the Senate, he was senator, and he could never speak in account of the rashness of his feelings. I've never seen him attempt it repeatedly and is often choked with rage. His passions are no doubt cooler now, but he is a dangerous man. Obviously, what you're getting here is President TJ is referring to Jackson as someone that is very hot-headed and, and will act out of impulse. Do these observations agree on any aspects of Jackson's character, or they seem to be describing two different people? Why might Jefferson himself, a revolutionary, regard Jackson as dangerous? So I'm going to skip down, guys. The first president from the West and the first nominated a formal party convention in 1832, and only the second without a college education. Washington was the first. Jackson was unique. His university was adversity. He had risen from the masses, but he was not one of them. Except in so far, he, is, he shared many of his prejudices. Essentially a frontier aristocrat, he owned many slaves, cultivated broad acres, and lived in one of the finest mansions in America, the Hermitage near Nashville, Tennessee. More Westerner than Easterner, more gentleman than common clay, more courtly than crude. He was hard to fit in a neat category. What they're trying to hear say here is that Andrew Jackson uh, represented many things of what a, of American identity at this point, right? I mean, he owned many slaves. He was a frontier, but yet an aristocrat. He was a frontiersman, but yet an aristocrat. Um, so they're saying in many ways he was hard to describe. But of course, you want to, you know, he represents a common man, someone that wasn't educated. Jackson's inauguration seemed to symbolize the ascendancy of the masses. Hickoryites poured into Washington from far away. Hickoryites are people that support Andrew Jackson. From far away, sleeping on the hotel floors and the hallways. They were curious to see their hero take office and perhaps hope to pick up a well-paying office for themselves. Nobody's mingled with notables at the White House and for the first time was thrown open to multitude. A milling crowd of rubbernecking clerks and shoekeepers, hobnailed artisans, and grimy laborers surged in, allegedly wrecking the china and furniture and threatening the people's champion with cracked ribs. Jackson was hastily spirited through a side door, and the White House miraculously emptied itself when the word had passed down that huge bowls of well spiked punch had placed on the lawns. Such was the inaugural ball. What they're trying to say here is Washington or Jackson threw a huge party during his inauguration. And you're getting many uh, Hickoryites, those supporters, people that supported him across uh, just different places coming in and labeling him the people's champion, meaning that he is the people's president. He represents the common man and they're celebrating this. Um, and you got to think a lot of people are criticizing him for this. Uh, why is he allowing so much chaos in the White House? As you will see in this paragraph. To conservatives, this orgy seemed like the end of the world. King Mob reigned triumphant as Jacksonian vulgarity replaced Jeffersonian simplicity. Faint-hearted traditionalists shuddered, drew their blinds, and recalled the trepidation of the opening scenes of the French Revolution. So overall, a couple things you want to understand with Hold Ickery as president, you need to understand in your notes that the main idea of this passage is that he represents that of the common man. He's not someone that is very well educated. He's considered a ruffian, you know, someone that's rough around the edges a tough man, a man with a strong military background. Um, and obviously, people that are very conservative, especially those that were more traditionalist, that were used to candidates such as a John Adams or a Thomas Jefferson, are going to be highly critical of this person in power. Um, a, par uh, a parallel that you can see is think about nowadays when you're looking at President Trump. President Trump is someone that in many ways, I mean, he doesn't represent the presidents that we've had in the past, people with a political background. And of course, with him coming to power, uh, it's definitely kind of, um, yeah, I mean, caused a little bit of, I don't want to say chaos, but it's it's definitely caused some conflict and uh, it's breaking the norm. So if you go ahead and you look at the questions here, uh, Jackson was the first president from which area? We went ahead and answer that. You will find that. Um, what was the presidential brawl? You will find that. And we are at the spoil system.
13.5, the spoil system. Once in power, the Democrats, uh, famously suspicious of the federal government, demonstrated that they were not above striking some bargains on their own. Under Jackson, the spoil system that is rewarding political supporters of public office was supported into the federal government on a large scale. The basic idea was as old as politics. It's a name came later from Senator William Marcy's classical mark in 1832. To the victor belonged the spoils of the enemy. The system had already secured a firm hold in New York and Pennsylvania, where wild grease machines ladled out the gravy of the office. So what you understand with the spoil system, it's a system in which that you reward people jobs that support you. They might not necessarily be the best person, but they support you. This is something that John Adams did not do. Quincy Adams, that is. Jackson defended the spoil system on democratic grounds. Every man is as good as his neighbor, he declared, perhaps equally better, as this was believed to be so. And his routine of office was thought to be simple enough for an upstanding American to learn quickly. Why encourage the development of an aristocrat, bureaucratic, office-holding class? Better bring in new blood, he argued. Each generation deserved its turn uh, at the public thorough. So he's basically saying he's going to appoint people that support him, right? Washington was due. It is true for house cleaning. No party overturn had occurred since the defeat of the Federalists in 1800. And even that had not produced wholesale evictions. A few office holders... Their commission signed by President Washington were lingering onto in their 80s, drawing breath and salary, but doing little else. But the spoil system was less about finding you blood than about rewarding old cronies. Throw the rascals out and put your rascals in, the Democrats were essentially saying. The questions asked of each appointee were not, what can he do, conf- what can he do for the country, but what has he done for the party? Is he loyal to Jackson? So one of the things that you want to see here is that if you are someone in office, uh, you're concerned about you losing your job because for a while, remember, ever since the Federalists were out of party uh, or or no longer in existence, you're starting to see the same people in power. And Andrew Jackson is going to go ahead and take everyone out that does not support him. All right. And in many ways, you need to swear an oath of loyalty to Andrew Jackson. Scandal inevitably accompanied the new system. Men who had openly bought their posts by campaign contributions were appointed high office. Uh, illiterates, incompetents, and plain crooks were given positions of public trust. Men of the make lusted for the spoils rather than the tolls of, toils of office. Samuel Swartzel, despite ample warnings of his untrustworthiness, was awarded a lucrative post of the collector of the customs of the poor New York. Nearly nine years later, he swore it out for England, leaving his accounts more than a million dollars short. Or swart wooded, sorry, out. England, leaving his accounts more than a million dollars short. The first person to steal a million from the Washington government. So with this paragraph, the main idea of this paragraph is basically saying that um, because the spoil system is not hiring the best candidates, only supporting or the best people in office, it's just hiring people that support Andrew Jackson. People that are uneducated and corrupt are now taking advantage of these positions. But despite its undeniable abuse, the spoil system was an important element of the emerging two-party order cementing, as it did, loyalty to party over competing claims based on economic class or geographic region. The promise of patronage provided a compelling reason for Americans to pick a party and stick with it through thick and thin, right? So, and of course, we went ahead and answered that question, what is the spoil system? Thirteen point six: the Treaty of Abomination. The Turkey Tariff of Abominations The touchy tariff issue had been one of John Quincy Adams' biggest headaches. Now, Andrew Jackson felt his predecessor's pain. Tariffs protected American industry against competition from European manufactured goods, but they also drove up prices for all Americans and invited retaliatory tariffs on American agricultural exports abroad. The Middle States had long been supporters of protectionist tariffs. In the 1820s, Influential New Englanders like Daniel Webster gave up their traditional defense of free trade to support higher tariffs, too. The wool and textile industries were booming, and forward-thinking Yankees came to believe that their prosperity would flow from the factory rather than from sea. So one of the things that you want to understand here is what tariffs are doing is they are taxing imported goods, goods from other areas. So what they're talking about here is that you're getting New Englanders like Daniel Webster, who gave up traditional defense of free trade to support high tariffs. So what they're saying here is these industries, such as wool and textiles, were booming. Uh, they t- came to believe that 
a lot of our prosperity and our money is going to come from an industrialized factory rather than from getting these goods from Europe. Okay. So if I were to sum up this paragraph, tariff abominations is tariffs um, in general were seen as a good thing to stop the importation of goods from other areas. All right. I'm going to skip down. He announced central insight in his book's first sentence. Among the novel subjects, on, among the novel subjects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States. One second, I actually want to see where we're at. Sorry, guys, I apologize. Okay, sorry, my apologies. I am just seeing where how this aligns with your book. Thinking globally. Alexis de Tocqueville, I probably said that wrong, on democracy in America, on democracy in America and Europe. On May 11, 1831, a 26-year-old Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, stepped ashore in New York City and began his fateful acquaintance with Andrew Jackson's America. For nine months, he visited the cities of the Atlantic seaboard from Boston to Washington, trekked west of Detroit, and floated down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. Keenly observing the American scene, Four years later, he published the first volume of his monumental work, Democracy in America. It remains today the probably the most insightful analysis of American society ever written and pres provides an indispensable starting point for understanding both the nature of modern democracy and the American national charter character. Our guy Tiville was born in the French Revolution area, and he witnessed the so-called July Revolution in France in 1830, which widened the French electorate. He was closely he was following closely the agitation in Britain for a broader, more domestic franchise, which culminated in the Land Form Bill of 1832. He also knew the several independent democratic republics that had blossomed in Latin America as disruptions of the Napoleonic Wars weakened Spain's imperial grip. Venezuela proclaimed its independence in 1811, Argentina in 1813, Chile in 1818, Mexico and Peru in 21. Brazil declared its independence from Portugal in 22, but remained a monarchy until it became a republic in 1889. Those, convinced, those events convinced him that democracy was an irresistible way of the future, but he was far less certain about what the democratic future might mean for human happiness, political stability, and social justice. Thus, he studied America to understand Europe and in, indeed the, words fate, the world's fate. In America, I saw more than America, he wrote. I sought the image of democracy of itself in order to learn what we had to fear to hope from its progress. So all in all, what you understand here is um, this Frenchman uh, who lived in France. You know, he's experienced a lot of political issues, but he's also studying a lot of the revolutions that were going on in Latin America. And he's kind of saying here at this point is that America, in America, I saw more than America. I sought the image of democracy itself. So we um, are looking at just America in many ways as, uh, as, as a figure in democracy, as kind of the model. In order to learn what we had to fear or to hope from its progress. So it is uh, what we could really describe as, I guess you could say, a successful democracy. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip down here. He announces central insight in his book's first sentence. Among the novel subjects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, nothing struck me more forcibly than general equality condition among the people. Uh, he acknowledged the primary fact of equality argued exercise a prodigious influence on the whole course of society. It is easy to understand why the scale and pervasiveness of American equality made some impression on Tocqueville. Mass democratic participation was already a well-established fact when he arrived. Almost 1.2 million voters, nearly 50% of the adult white male population, had cast their ballots in the election that had bought the, to the White House in 1828. In contrast, France's July Revolution had enfranchised fewer than 200,000 property males, less than 1% of the population in 1830, and Britain's Reform Bill of 1832 would extend voting rights uh, only to some 800,000 male property holders in a country with 50% more people than the United States. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing American voter turnout to actually be very good. The fact that nearly 50% of the adult white male population is actually voting. So it is during this time in 1828, of course, that uh, property requirements are taken out. That's important to know that you only now need to be white in order to vote. And, of course, a citizen. Uh, Tocqueville repeatedly remarked on seceding relentless energy in the American equality unleash, and he speculated on two possible futures for the United States. They might be called, respectively, uh, centripetal and also centrifugal scenarios. In the first scenario, 
Tocqueville thought that the doctrine of equality might breed a suffocating conformity that would eventually invoke the power of the state to enforce a stern and repressive consensus, the kind of tyranny of the majority uh, that had worried founders like James Madison. Tocqueville thought he saw signs that a future was already emerging. I know of no country in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom of discussion as in America. So what he's saying in here is the doctrine of equality might breed a suffocating conformity that would eventually invoke the power of the state to enforce a stern and repressive consensus. In other words, here, tyranny of the majority. Right. So this is what they're talking about here is um, when you're giving too much independence to people and in some ways turns into mob rule. Right, rule of the majority, right? That if you're a minority, you might not necessarily have your views heard or seen. In the second scenario, equality might foster radical individualism, a word that's Coville coined to capture the unique psychology he encountered everywhere in America. As social conditions become more equal, he wrote, people acquire in the habit of always considering themselves as standing alone, and they're apt to imagine that their whole destiny is in their own hands. In this case, knowing individuals, loneliness, and even social anarchy might define America's future. Democracy makes every man forget his ancestors, Togo wrote. It throws him back forever upon himself and threatens in the end to confine him entirely with the solitude of his own heart. Tocqueville noted several factors that mitigated both of these grim prospects and held American democracy in healthy balance. The, the absence of hostile countries on its borders, a vigorously free press and robust volunteer associations, especially churches and political parties, and crucially, habits of heart, which sustained a sense of civic belonging and responsibility. Tukovo raised troubling questions on whether those factors would prove durable. If not, uh, what ultimate fate might democracy be? Ironically, today, the United States has markedly lower rates of political partition than many other countries, especially those in Europe. Can it be that America, the pioneer mass democracy that served this Tokyo's laboratory in his window of the future, has proved to be less fertile soil for the development of democracy rather than the old world societies in which he compared to? So all in all, what you understand in this section is that America at this point is the most democratic nation. We're getting a lot of participation amongst people across all social classes. Um, and this is all happening during Jackson's presidency. Okay. Uh, so when we're going over here, so right now, I mean, we should be. We did cover these. What did uh, what did tariffs do? Uh, why were New England and Westerners fine with tariffs? Well, uh, white Southerners were not great fans of tariffs, right? Um, so a couple of things that you want to understand here, because I think this is one that a lot of people struggle with. Why were New Englanders and Westerners fine with the tariffs? Specifically because um, when we go back here, the middle class, the middle states had long been supporters of protectionist tariffs. In the 1820s, New Englanders like Daniel Webster gave up their traditional defense of free trade to support higher tariffs. And here's why. Uh, the wool and textile industries are booming. And forward-thinking Yankees can believe that their future prosperity would flow from the factory. So in other words, what we're getting here for this question is specifically, where the heck was that, is industrialization, right? Um, they were fine with this tariff specifically because they felt as if uh, that the factory was a way for them to gain their prosperity. On the other hand, Southerners, remember, um, you're getting a lot of the planners. Uh, and what they feared was that if you are taxing imported goods, you're going to get the reverse that's going to happen in Europe. Right, uh, that Europeans then are going to tax and put a tariff on the United States, meaning the Southerners are going to struggle, right? Um, and that's what we have right there. So we are then moving on to number twenty-one. Uh, what did the South Carolina Exposition and Protest say? Who authored the work? Um, so of course the South hates these tariffs, especially South Carolina. The stage was set for a showdown. Though Jackson's first term. Through Jackson's first term, the nullifiers, the nullies, they were called, tried strenuously to muster the two-thirds vote for nullification in South Carolina legislature, but they were blocked by the determined minority of unionists, scorned as submission men. Back in Washington, Congress tipped the balance by passing the new tariff of 1832. Uh, though it pared away the worst abominations of 1828, it was still frankly protective and fell short of meeting Southern demands. Worse yet, too many Southerners had this quieting air of permanence. The nullification crisis deepens. So one thing that you want to understand here is, um, remember, it's called the tariff of, of abomination. So you go back to that question. Um, oh, I answered these for you. 
for the most part. The South is unhappy because if you are instilling a tariff on imported goods, uh, they also fear that their goods are also going to be taxed as well, right? Um, so with that in mind, the want to nullify. Remember, nullify means just a refusal to follow um, just the laws, right, set by the government. Uh, South Carolina was now served was was now served for drastic action. Nullifiers and unionists clash head end on state election of 1832 nullies, uh, defiantly wearing palmetto ribbons on their hats to mark their loyalty to the Palmetto State. Uh, emerged with more than two thirds majority. The state legislature then called for a special convention. Several weeks later, several weeks later, the delegates meet in Columbia, solemnly declare the existing tariff to be null and void within South Carolina. As a further act of defiance, the convention threatened to take South Carolina out of the union if Washington attempted to collect the customs duties by force. Uh, so one of the things is remember, and they're not. I mean, they're not happy with about this. The South is not like this tariff. Um, obviously, it's increasing prices for them. So what they decided to do is two things. In this paragraph, they refuse to follow it, and they also threaten to leave the union. Right. So meaning they're no longer going to be part of the United States, right? So overall, what you want to understand these two paragraphs, if you're writing your notes, no in South Carolina, main thing, South Carolina is not happy with the uh, nullification, or sorry, they're not happy with the tariffs, so therefore they nullify, meaning refuse to follow it, and they threaten to secede from the union. Such tactics might have intimidated John Quincy Adams, but Andrew Jackson was the wrong president to stare down. Kansas Kansakiris General was not a die-hard or supporter of the tariff, but he would not permit defiance or disunion. His military instincts rasped. Jackson privately threatened to invade the state and gave and have the nullifiers hanged. In public, he was only slightly less pugnacious. He dispatched naval and military reinforcements to the Palmetto State, which quietly preparing a sizable, a sizable army. He also issued a ring, a ringing proclamation against nullification, to which the governor of South Carolina, former Senator Robert Hayne, responded with counter proclamation. The lines were drawn. If civil wars was to be divided, one would have to surrender, or both would have to compromise. So what they're saying here in this paragraph is Andrew Jackson basically says, hey, you can't nullify, you can't secede from the Union. He threatens to go ahead and kill these nullifiers, people that in the South Carolina that do not want to go ahead and follow through. Um, and John Quincy Adams wouldn't have done that. But obviously, Andrew Jackson has that strong military background. Remember, he's a ruffian, right? Uh, so the laws are drawn. Civil war is almost going to happen here. Okay. Uh, conciliatory Henry Clay of Kentucky, now in the Senate, stepped forward. An unforgiving foe of Jackson, he had no desire to see his old enemy win new laurels by crushing the Carolinians and returning with the scalp of Calhoun dangling from his belt. Although he himself is supportive of tariffs, this gallant Kentuckian uh, therefore threw his influence behind a compromise bills that would gradually reduce the tariff of 1832 by 10% over a, temp over a period of eight years. By 1842, the rates would be back to the mildly protected para tariff level of 1816. So what this paragraph is basically saying here is Henry Clay, um, even though he is, uh, he's for a tariff, right? Um, one of the things that he decides to do is he goes ahead and he, he helps form a compromise where they lower this tariff. And the main reason is he knows that Andrew Jackson is going to go ahead and kill and take off, you know, John C. Calhoun's scalp. And John C. Calhoun is from South Carolina. He knows that he's going to engage war and this might lead to a civil war. So Henry Clay goes ahead and they come up with the compromise of 1883. The compromise of 1833 finally squeezed through Congress. Debate was bitter with most of the opposition naturally coming from a protectionist New England and the Middle States. Calhoun in the South favored the compromise, so it was evident that Jackson would not have to use firearms and rope. But at the same time, uh, the part, and partly as a face-saving device, Congress passed a force bill, known among the Carolinians as the Bloody Bill. It authorized the president to use Army and Navy, if necessary, to collect federal tariff and duties. So a couple things you understand here is that the compromise with lowering tariff happens, but Congress also passes the force bill. This says that if uh, laws are not followed, Congress can use the Army and Navy if necessary, right? South Carolinians welcomed this opportunity to extricate themselves from a dangerously tight corner without loss of face. To the concentration of Calhounites, no other Southern states had sprung to their support. Through Georgia and Virginia, toyed with the idea Moreover, an appreciable unionist minority within South Carolina was gathering guns, organizing militias, and nailing stars and stripes to flagpoles. Faced with civil war and invasion, 
uh, from without, the Columbia Convention met again and repealed the Ordinance of Nullification. As a final but futile gesture of fist shaking, it nullified the unnecessary force bill um, and adjourned. So a couple things that you want to understand here, uh, the South Carolina goes ahead and they nullify uh, the force bill, right? Meaning that they don't agree to it, right? Um, uh, yeah, that's basically the main thing you want to understand there. Senator Jackson Northern Nullies won a clear cut victory in 1833. Clay was a true uh, hero of the hour. Hale and Charleston and Boston alike for saving the country. Armed conflict had been avoided, but the fundamental issues had been resolved. When the next nullies in the Union clash, compromise would prove more elusive. This is obviously going to be the Civil War. Uh, so overall, for the section, main idea you want to understand is South Carolina refuses to abide by the tariff of abominations. I mean, remember, that's a tax on imported goods. Um, so as a result of this, what they end up doing is they nullify. Nullify means refusing to follow a federal order or federal law. Uh, Andrew Jackson's not happy with this, so he threatens to send the military. He's a ruffian. Remember that. Uh, Henry Clay comes in, and they create the compromise tariff of 1833, uh, which goes ahead and lowers the tariff. So Henry Clay is the hero of the day. I like that rhyme. Um, so, and we can see this. I mean, we answered 22, uh, South, Car uh, South Carolina exposition, right? We talked about nullification, what that means, right? Yeah, so we went ahead and we've answered everything here all the way up until question number 28, 28. Um, I mean, some things up here, obviously you need to, I talked about Henry Clay, we talked about this tariff being a compromise. Uh, we talked about the force bill. They obviously did not accept it, right? Um, so next we are moving to the Indian Removal Act. The Trail of Tears, 13.8. Jackson's Democrats were committed to Western expansion, but much expansion necessarily meant confrontation with the current inhabitants of the land. More than 125,000 Native Americans lived in the forests, prairies, and east of the Mississippis in the 1820s. Federal policy towards a varied beginning in the 1790s. The Washington government intensely recognized the tribes as separate nations and agreed to acquire land from them through no formal treaties. The Indians were shrewd and stubborn negotiators, but this availed them. Little when Americans routinely violated their own covenants, erasing and drawing tree line after tree line on their maps as white settlement pushed west. This is obviously talking about Western expansion that's going on, and of course, the Native Americans are not happy with that. Jackson, the Great Father, in the Trail of Tears. Okay, I'm going to skip these two sections right here. Many white Americans felt admiration for the Indians and believed that they could be assimilated into white society. Much energy, therefore, was devoted to civilizing and Christianizing the Indians. The, the Society of the Propagating Gospel Among Indians was founded in 1787, and many denominations sent missionaries into the Indian villages. In 1793, Congress appropriated $20,000 for the promotion of literacy and agricultural and vocational instruction among the Indians. We will understand the main point of this paragraph in 1787, um, basically the Propagating Gospel Among Indians, the Society, uh, they're meant to assimilate and make these Indians, I guess you could say, more American. Although many tribes violently resisted white encroachment, others followed the path of accommodation. The Cherokees of Georgia made the Cherokees of Georgia made especially remarkable efforts to learn the ways of the whites. They gradually abandoned their semi-nomadic life and adopted a system of settled agriculture and notion of private property. Missionaries opened schools among the Cherokees, and the Indians. Sequoia devised a Cherokee alphabet. In 1808, the Cherokee National Council legislated a written legal code in 1827. It adopted a written constitution that provided for executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the government. Some Cherokees became prosperous cotton planters and even turned to slaveholding. Nearly 1,300 enslaved blacks toiled their native masters in the Cherokee Nation in the 1820s. For these efforts, the Cherokees, along with the Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Seminoles were numbered were numbered by whites among the free civilized tribes. So one thing you want to understand here, this paragraph, the main point of this obviously shows that the Cherokee Indians, and this, along with other tribes, they didn't want to assimilate and I guess you could say become uh, more like the Americans. 
right? More, uh, they became more engaged in the American identity. You could see this through the government that they had, as well as the creation of the alphabet. All this embrace of civilization apparently was not good enough for the whites. In 1828, the Georgia legislature declared that the Cherokee Tribal Council, a legal, asserted its own jurisdiction over Indian affairs and Indian lands. The Cherokees appealed this move to the Supreme Court, which thrice upheld the rights of Indians. But President Jackson, who clearly wanted to open Indian lands to white settlement, refused to recognize the court's decisions. In a callous jibe at the Indian's defender, Jackson allegedly snapped. John Marshall has made a decision. Now let him enforce it. So one of the things you want to understand here is the Supreme Court has made a decision. However, uh, remember, um, the Supreme Court does not have the authority to actually mandate a decision, right? All it does is just interpret the Constitution in court cases. So John, um, so what Andrew Jackson here is doing is he's challenging John Marshall. He said he's made his decision, but let's see this actually try to be enforced, meaning he's just going to ignore it. Feeling some obligation to rescue this much injured race, Jackson proposed a bodily removal of the remaining eastern tribes, chiefly the Cherokees, Craws, Chukitsas, Chickasaws, and Seminoles beyond the Mississippi. Emigration was supposed to be voluntary because it would be cruel and unjust to compel the Aborigines to abandon the graves of their fathers. Um, Jackson evidently consoled himself with the belief that the Indians could preserve their native cultures in the open Midwest. So in other words, Jackson is going ahead and he's using military force to move these Indians west. And he says, yes, they can still practice their own culture, but it will be in the west. Yeah. Jackson's policy led to the forced uprooting of more than 100,000 Indians. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, providing for the transplanting of all American tribes, then resident east of the Mississippi. Ironically, the heaviest blows fell on the five civilized tribes. In the ensuing decade, countless Indians died on the forced marches. Notably, the Cherokees, along the notorious Trail of Tears, the newly established Indian country, were to be permanently free of white encroachments. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was established in 1836 to administer relations with America's original inhabitants. But as land-hungry pale faces pushed west, Faster than anticipated, the government's guarantees went up in smoke. The permanent frontier lasted up in f for about 15 years. Um, so what this passage is basically talking about is an Indian Removal Act, which means the forced movement migration of Native Americans westward. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is established uh, in 1836, and the purpose of this is, is just to monitor this process that it goes on. Uh, it's obviously not successful. So uh, a couple of things that we should have here. Uh, what were the five civilized tribes? Uh, why were they called this? Um, you could find those tribes on your own, but obviously because they were looking to uh, assimilate. You know, they did engage in the assimilation process. What did the 1830 Indian Removal Act call for? What was the Trail of Tears? Um, obviously, when we're looking through here, it's calling for the movement of Native Americans westward, right? And the Trail of Tears is you could read this on your own right here, right? Is obviously the death of thousands of Native Americans uh, in the fall of 1838 to 1839, right? Because the army is forcibly moving them westward. Um, I mean, just imagine going through uh, this 116 day journey. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and this is all during Jackson's presidency. Yeah. All right, so we will, the next video that we will do, will focus on the bank war. 13.9.